Yeah, it's working. Oh, thank yeah, God. It's working. Great, great. <laughs> okay. Mm, yeah. Then, Mama, Mama, I will tell you, yeah. I will tell you. Just okay. start recording, step by step. You need to allow the participants in the broadcast. It is. Yeah, you, 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 you can start. You can start now. You can start now. So very good morning to one and all. Uh, so we are in uh, session two of the second day. And before starting, may I request all the participants to use the headphones for a clear audio. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Dipankar Das Sharma. And it's a honor to have uh, you here, sir. So Dr. Dipankar Das Sharma is a scientist and structural chemist known for his researches in the field of solid state chemistry, spectroscopy, condensed matter physics, material science, and nanoscience. He is a recipient of TWAS Physics Prize and the UNESCO Biennial Javed Hussain Prize. Sharma was honored by the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSER Government of India in 1994, with the Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology. Presently, he is JN Tata Chair Professor at the Solid State and Structural uh, Chemistry Unit of the Indian Institute of Science. Professor Sharma is a senior uh, uh, editor of ACS Energy Letters and a member of the editorial boards of several uh, peer reviewed journals. So it's a honor to have you here, uh, Dr. Sharma, and may I request uh, you to uh, deliver your lecture. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let yeah. me start by sharing my screen. I'm not able to share the screen unless you give me the permission to. I think uh, Dr. Salapan has to, okay, I think now it will work, just a moment. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, do you see my screen presentation yes. mod? Okay, uh, let me also get the laser pointers so that, uh, because there's a new technology and you have to get used to the new things. Thank you very much, uh, President Nimala Grace. Yeah, uh, it's been a wonderful yeah. uh, for the invitation that you've extended to us and for organizing this virtual conference. As Andrew and I were discussing, I think it's a new form. It has many advantages of, for example, it saves a lot of time and effort. The environment is saved a lot. Of course, it has the unique aspect that you don't get to see your audience, so you don't know uh, whether they're relating to your and, that's and sometimes there are, uh, of course, background noises. Uh, let me get started by talking about uh, the topic that you have already announced. Um, I, yeah, yeah, so, I'm going to talk about, as already announced, nature and origin of metastable states in chemically exfoliated fuller MOS. So it's a, a long title, and I'll explain as I go along how to understand various parts of it. But what I'm going to stress on is that I'm going to talk about, of course, MOS2. And the particular variety of MOS2 that I'm going to talk about is going to be few layers of MOS2 to put together. We don't uh, quite specify how many there are. They're typically in the range of one to five monolayers stacked together. The way we reach to that a few layer of MOS2 is via the chemical exfoliation technique. And that would play a very important role in uh, the entire discussion that I'm going to present today. And the question that we are asking that this particular route of getting the chemically exfoliated fuel layer MOS2, what is its nature? The nature that we are talking about is going to be basically geometric and electronic structure of this material, because there's a lot of confusion about it. And I'll explain that as I go along. And then I'll try to also hint at what is the origin uh, at, that controls the geometric and the electronic structure of this material that I'm going to propose. So let's get on. And uh, I don't have to talk about graphene. It's a two-dimensional system, extraordinarily famous, extraordinarily exciting. And you also know that there's a whole family of two-dimensional systems, not only graphene. Since graphene's time, we have exfoliated almost every kind of uh, easily exfoliable system and also more complicated system. The more famous of them are listed here, boron nitrides, carbon nitride, metal dichalcogenides, silicine, MgB2, and many others. And that's a huge family. And obviously we're not going to talk about all of them in one talk. So we need to focus our mind onto a subclass of it. And what I'm going to talk about is the metal dichalcogenides. I'm providing you this background such that you understand that the, what I'm going to talk about has an interrelationship, interconnection with the family of two-dimensional systems that we talk about. 
the what is metal dichalcogenides it's actually as i have already said is an intrinsically two dimensional system that is stacked three dimensionally as you can see over here uh, the difference between graphene graphene the one monolayer consists of just one atomic layer what is the metal dichalcogenides by the formula you know because it's something like mx2 it's a metal m and di2 of the chalcogen x so mx2 is the typical formula you have the metal layer hexagonally arranged in the central layer and there's a sulfur layer on top and sulfur layer below making it mx2 and this is the monolayer unit consisting of three atomic layers and they're separated from the next layer by van der waals gap making these essentially 2d even when you have a bulk system because the bulk system consists of these 2d stacks one on top of the other now metal type chalcogenide is also a very wide spectrum of compounds with very wide forms of properties that it exhibits like if you think of the vanadium disulfide so the metal you have chosen to be vanadium and chalcogen to be sulfur it's a metal you can have semiconductors like tungsten disulfide molybdenum disulfide you can have superconductors like nbse2 you can have even more exciting things like charge density waves tantalum disulfide so there's a whole zoo of properties that you can get out of a single family of metal dichalcogenides and of course we cannot talk about all of it we have to again focus our mind on to one of them and what we are going to focus our mind on is going to be the mos2 <clears throat> now what is mos2 it's of course the structure that i've shown you it is essentially in the bulk form if i look at it it's an indirect band gap large band gap semiconductor now this bulk layer if i exfoliate one single layer that i showed taking it out from the bulk it turns out to be an direct band gap so an indirect band gap semiconductor makes a transition into direct band gap when i look at only a single layer of this mos2 but beyond that more recently over the last 5 6 7 years people realized that there is yet another form of mos2 that forms which is very has unique properties compared to the ones that i have talked about here because this way of forming a single layer is by mechanical exfoliation but you know mechanical exfoliation gives you one single layer you cannot make too many layers together and for any application you might like to have you know millions and millions of these few layered mos2 people found out there's a way of doing that by chemical exfoliation which i'll not talk about in detail but the essential idea is that since you have this van der waals gap you can stick in lithium ions inside thereby soaking mos2 into some lithium containing solvent lithium gets into these and then it, what it does lithium while getting into these they separate out the layers further and very easily by ultrasilication or some other method they fall apart and you have few layered mos2s in copious amount when people started looking at the properties of this kind of chemically exfoliated mos2 they found they are very good for supercapacitors here is what is called the ragone plot i'll not go into that essentially it has the energy density plotted this way power density plotted this way and any storage material you want it to go along this diagonal and make it higher and higher so that it has both very high energy density and high power density and in this ragone plot this mos2 sits up there and you can see it has extraordinary properties of having optimized and maximized both energy density and power density not only that people also found that for hydrogen evolution reaction these are also very good to uh, look at and they people have been very very excited about it in the application of mos2 in this particular what's the difference between this form that i talked about which is the insulating form it has a crystal structure that we denote as h and this form to this particular form which is from chemical exfoliation that comes from actually the t form which is a different crystal structure not only that people believe that t form is actually metallic whereas i have already told you the h form is insulating so by via the chemical exfoliation we are able to change the structure and get to some other kind of mos2 which has a totally different properties than the mos2 that i get over here even when i make mechanically exfoliated mos2 in this particular range and this is the part that i'm going to talk about 
why does it come about and what kind of structure I'm talking about this H and T? Let me explain to you briefly. The stable structure, the normally found structure of the bulk MOS2, which is the H form, has molybdenum, as I have told you, in a hexagonal pattern in the central layer. There's a sulfur layer on top and the sulfur layer below. This sulfur layer on top also forms a hexagonal structure, and this also forms a hexagonal structure. And these two hexagonal structures are directly on top of each other. As you can see, this sulfur layer, sulfur is directly above this one, this one is directly above this one, and this one. So what do I have is a coordination of MO surrounded by six oxygen. This forms a triangle, that forms a triangle, and this triangle and that triangle eclipse each other one on top of the other. So that's my MOS2. So it's a trigonal biprismic structure. And that, if I look from the top down, then of course this one eclipses that one. So what I'm going to see, there's one molybdenum. I see the top sulfur here, the bottom sulfur is below that. Top sulfur is here, bottom sulfur is below that, as shown over here in the side view. Okay, so I'll see exactly this. But now imagine that I'm going to shift, translate this top sulfur layer, only the top sulfur layer, drag it along such that this sulfur comes and sits here. What will that do? This sulfur will get dragged here, this sulfur will get dragged here, but there is one sulfur below that will stay here, one sulfur below that will stay here, one sulfur below here, stay here, and I'll get new layer, the top layer will come here, 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 such that now I'll see all the sulfurs. So basically, when I do that dragging that I talked about, you'll find that the two triangles, one on top and the other below, go from the eclipse to anti-eclipse structure, giving rise to what is shown below over here, that now you have molybdenum, you can see the three sulfurs below and the three sulfurs above, giving rise to an octahedral structure. So from, it's a trigonal biprismic structure, I go over to an octahedral structure by doing this slide. That is essentially the idea. I've already said this is the stable structure and this is the metastable structure. They are distinguished by the fact this is prismatic and this is octahedral structure. I have said this is a large band gap semiconductor or an insulator. And this I say it is a metal. Why did I say that? Can I understand that on the basis of just the structural considerations? And let me tell you that there is a very simple way of thinking and understanding this. And that is shown over here. In the prismatic structure, I have a molybdenum here, three sulfurs are on top, three sulfurs below. And the D level, because of the crystal field and ligand field, will split into this particular way. There will be DZ squared, that will be the lowest energy. And there's going to be the other four D levels far above, and that's a large gap over here. Now, molybdenum disulfide with molybdenum in four plus oxidation state has two electrons left in it. Those two electrons go in here. You can see it's a fully filled shell, and so it's an insulator. And there's a large gap because of a large crystal field splitting and ligand field splitting. And therefore, that large gap translates when I make the solid, an infinite solid made of these units, each of these become a band, of course, but this large gap survives, giving me a large gap semiconductor. What happens in the T phase? In the T phase, of course, I have an octahedral structure, the anti-eclipse triangles that I talked about. And you all know that the D states split in an octahedral field into T2G triply degenerate and EG doubly degenerate state. But I have only two electrons. The two electrons go there and this particular state remains empty and they're degenerate. So when the band forms, you can see it's a partially occupied band. And so it's a metal. And therefore the T form tends to become metal and calculations indeed show that it's a metal. But there is a twist here. The twist is that you can see that it's a degenerate state, which means it will tend to have a spontaneous distortion, Yantala distortion. These will not remain symmetric triangles as shown over here, because energy can be lowered by making small distortions. And such small distortions, if they happen, and theoretically predicted they'll happen, this particular state in 
we lift this degeneracy that makes it metallic, making it a level go down and two levels go up. And these level will get the two electrons. And you can see that now it will make a small gap because I'm getting small distortion to lift the degeneracy of the ground state here. And so I'll get a small band gap insulator. And various kind of distortions can give rise to this. And depending on the particular distortion we are talking about, it's termed as T prime, T double prime, T triple prime, et cetera. What are these structures? The T structure, as I told you, is the undistorted one around every molybdenum, which is a black one. Like here, you can see six sulfurs around it, three sulfurs on top, three sulfurs below, making the octahedral structure perfectly symmetric structure. And that's metallic. And if this is the primitive unit cell, one by one, A by A, the T prime structure that I talked about is formed by bringing these two molybdenum slightly closer together and these two slightly farther apart. So this is called a dimerization. And that is dimerized units make a zigzag pattern, as I'm showing you, forming a structure that can be called a root three by one unit cell or a two by one unit cell, both are equivalent as shown over here. And this dimerization, this distortion, tends to open up a very small gap, as I've said. But there are other distortions, like you have a T double prime structure, where you find a tetramerization. The four molybdenum, they come closer together, and the other molybdenum molybdenum distances become larger. And the unit cell then becomes two by two. There's a trimerized version where three molybdenums come closer together and they, this coming together is compensated by elongating this bond length and the unit cell is shown over here is a root three by root three structure. So there are many different structures possible. The question really is, when I do the chemical exfoliation, which structure does it form? And that's the question one wants to answer. Now, one would say that, look, density functional theory we know have been very good in predicting structure from total energy calculation by optimization. And let's do that calculation. It turns out that if you do the calculation, and of course, the H phase, which is the lowest energy structure, which is the stable structure, and that's my energy reference. The T structure, the undistorted metallic structure, is 830 milli electron volt above, very unstable. The T double prime structure, so you can see that it will spontaneously distort because going from T to T double prime, it stabilizes, lowers its energy. And this is what I said because of the Yantela distortion. Now the T prime and T triple prime structure almost degenerate. They are even sta more stable than T double prime and they lie over here at this energy above. So this is still very metastable with respect to the stable structure. And one would expect most likely it's the T prime and T triple prime that would form for energetic reason. But this is theoretical. One would like to know experimentally. Experimentally, there's been a lot of claims, lot of studies. Most of them assumed the structure to be the undistorted T structure. And there are some TEM experiments also that found T structure in small patches, but also TEM found T prime, T double prime, T triple prime structure. So TEM really didn't solve the problem for us. But in general, people have thought that it's a metallic T structure, as I'm showing you from several such uh, publications. And there are many, many other publications. So the dominant view was that it's a T, and so it's metallic. Sometimes people found that it's sort of metallic in nature. And so they reverse the entire argument and say that since it's metallic in nature, so it must be the T structure. So the question when we went into this problem was really, can we figure out in a proper manner, in a convincing manner, what is the chemically exfoliated state, this metastable state? Is it T, T prime, T double prime, T triple prime? And what is its nature? Is it metallic or insulating? And there are other questions that I'll come to later and not right now at this stage. And this is the work that was addressed some years ago uh, by Bernabe Pal, who was an extraordinary student, supported by another set of very extraordinary group members who are all shown over here, Sharda, Pratibha, Avinav, and Sumanto. These two are postdocs. And we collaborated extensively with JNCSR, my colleague Umesh Wagmari and his student Anjali. And the experiments I'm going to present it was carried out at Centrotron Center at Electra with tremendous support from Matteo, Luca, and Hickman. 
And uh, this was published in PhysRev in 2017. You can look up the paper. Let me briefly tell you. But before I tell you that, there's an earlier work that we had done in collaboration with Arindam Ghosh's group, where they we looked at a sample they made, which was a mechanically exfoliated, mind you, it's mechanically exfoliated, not chemically exfoliated, uh, MOS2, to understand its nature. And this is the electron spectroscopic result that I'm showing you. So electron spectroscopic photoemission result, you can see that there's open circles at the data points. So focus on the data points at the moment. There's a bump here, which comes from sulfur 2S signal. Then there's a sharp peak here, which is the molybdenum 3D5 half. And then another sharp peak, which is coming from molybdenum 3D3 half as written down over here and here. And we try to understand the line shape properly by fitting it to the expected line shape. And you can see that the, the yellow line going through the data is the simulated curve that you have got. What we found and important for our discussion here is that this fitting could not be done by assuming just only one kind of molybdenum, which is shown with blue here. We needed a small minority phase of another molybdenum, the red one that is shown over here a very small amount, and we identified that with the T phase. We said that even in mechanically exfoliated H sample, there are traces of small amount of T phase, and we in fact called it the metallic T phase at that time. But what is important for our purpose here is to note that there is a very large energy difference between this metastable T state form and the stable H form. There's a large binding energy difference. And this is going to play a very important role in what I'm going to talk about. Electron spectroscopy normally is done, suppose you have a small sample, like a mechanically exfoliated MOS2, and you have a small green patch, which is the metastable state, and a larger uh, stable patch, the brown patch. The photons come in in a wide range, flood the entire system, and then we detect the electrons of that and we measure what the spectrum looks like. And the spectrum looks like this, a very complicated one, which is a sum total of all the part, the metastable state as well as the stable state. And so it becomes very difficult to explain and understand what this complex structure is due to. And you have to do the kind of separation that I talked about. But what one would like to do is instead of coming with a very broad beam of photon, the broad beam of photon that is coming, you put a lens in front of it and then bunch it up very tightly. And if you can do that, now you can focus this particular photon to fall only on the green one and get the green signal. And then you put the bunch on the gray part and get the gray signal here. Whereas the sum of this green signal and gray signal is your white signal that you get with a white beam. This is called photoelectron microscopy. And of course, the resolution depends on how tightly you can bunch this. And it's a very difficult technique. And there are only a few uh, synchrotron centers where you can do this. And the, one of the best beam line is ESCA microscopy, Lucas beam line. And that's where we did this experiment. And the spot size of the photon was 100 nanometer, 0.1 micron. So that is our space resolution. So we'll do this technique of coming with a very small spot and try to understand what the electronic structure is. When we look at it, uh, our uh, sample, this chemically exfoliated one, you can see now the spectral features are somewhat broader than what I showed you before. But before I get into that, I can, what I can do, this is my molybdenum signal. This molybdenum signal, the total intensity I can integrate and I can take this spot from one place to the other on the sample and see what the intensity map is like. So when I do the intensity map, you can see the molybdenum disulfide chemically exfoliated flake clearly. This is the substrate on which the flake is sitting and I can see where the flake is. And I can put my photon at any point on this. Where do I want to put it? I want to put it at a place where I have the maximum amount of the chemically exfoliated metastable state. How can I figure that out? In order to figure that out, as I have said, that this is rather broad. If I compare it with my sharp signal of only the H phase that I've shown you about, it's very sharp. So let's overlap these two and see where the difference is coming. You can see that it becomes broad because of a contribution on the lower binding energy side. This side is lower binding energy and this side is higher binding energy. So it's broadened on the lower binding energy side. 
So now I can subdivide this wide range that I had talked about here, wide range of energy into two parts. The blue part is where the H phase contributes and the metastable state because of the large binding energy shift that I showed you earlier contributes here. So now uh, what I'm going to do is to have the intensity of this part divided by the intensity of that part. I'll plot it out wherever that is maximum. That's where I have the maximum metastable state. And when I do that mapping is shown over here, the same flake now is showing that this is the place where I have the maximum contribution from the metastable state. So I'm going to put my photon exactly at that spot and see what the electronic structure is with a resolution of 0.1 micron 100 nanometer. Having done that, when I do that, I find this structure that I've shown you already, and now I can separate it out in terms of the metastable state contribution and the stable state contribution. And you can see that the metastable state is much larger than the stable H phase, <clears throat> which allows me to now address the question, what is the electronic structure of it? I know at this spot, what is the ratio of the metastable state to the stable state, because that would be important to extract the electronic structure from the valence band when I look at it. But before that, now, since we know how to identify this term, we are going to ask the question, is it metallic or insulating? The question of metallic or insulating can be answered very easily from photo emission, because all that you are asking, do I have a finite density of states at the Fermi energy? All metals have finite density of states at Fermi energy. All semiconductors have very small or zero uh, intensity at the Fermi energy. So all that I need to do is to record the valence band spectrum, which is shown over here. Identify where the Fermi energy is, which is a zero of the energy scale. And look at that small part and ask the question, is there finite intensity or not? Since I'm interested in only that part, let me expand that part, which is plotted over here. This is the Fermi energy. This is the H phase, which has a large band gap. And you can see it has no intensity at the Fermi energy. Also, this mechanic, chemically exfoliated species has no intensity at the Fermi energy. Therefore, it is a semiconducting state very clearly the material I'm looking at insulated, it's not a metal, which means it cannot be the T phase. It has to be one of the distorted phases. Having understood that, then we ask the question, can I figure out which of the uh, particular distorted state it forms? Now, in order to understand that, I have to look at it more closely. <clears throat> First, let me show you what the H phase looks like. H phase in the valence band, where you are seeing this whole spectrum, over the same energy scale, H phase looks like this, nicely, beautifully structured. And we understand it very well from a theoretical point of view. I'll not go into the details. It turns out that we need to use the most sophisticated GW calculation in order to describe this. Let me just give you the sum total, the result. This is the calculated result coming from the GW calculation, which simulates very well this particular spectral features. There's a purpose why I needed to find out which is the theory that explains it the best. You'll see it in a moment. Having answered that GW is a good theory for it, I set it aside and go back to my experiment. Remember, this structure is coming from my metastable state plus a little bit of the stable configuration. How much metastable and how much stable I remember, remember that I know it from the core level, what is the ratio of my uh, metastable state to the stable state. So exact same proportion, I'm going to subtract this one out from here so that I know what is the valence band structure only of the metastable state. So I subtract that proportion, it is shown over here from this structure. I also subtract the substrate contribution, because I'm talking about a very thin layer, my substrate contributes some, and I have a way of exactly knowing how much the substrate contributes, and that is over here. After subtracting all that, I get the metastable shows, state shows this valence band structure shown over here. Now, how do I know which phase that belongs to? This is where the theory that I have already done a litmus test on that, that it's a good theory gw calculation i asked gw calculation tell me what should be the structure for various distorted states t prime t double prime t triple prime and it turns out it is the t double prime state that fits it the best t prime sorry not t double t prime state that fits it the best and the calculated shown over here and this is the experimental data showing that it is a t prime phase that forms 
this is of course a, this is all published in this but this is an unusual way of figuring out the from the electronic structure what the geometric structure is normally we go the other way knowing the geometric structure we can answer what the electronic structure is from theory is there a more direct way of showing this and let me show you that there is a more direct way and that comes from raman spectroscopy raman spectroscopy of the metastable uh, of the stable state is extremely well known it shows two very distinct sharp features e1g and e1g vibrations shown over here if we do a chemical exfoliation and this is a technique everybody does because that shows all these additional features you can see over here very weak original stable phase here and the metastable phase and this is everybody does this is the primary characterization to say that yes i have the metastable state now i'm going to look at all metastable states all such reports from the literature and mark where they found the peaks in their experiments and this is an exercise that we did recently and this is published in this particular paper this year starting from 2011 when the first report came the peaks were found so i'm going to tell the year when it was found and the report and where they found the peak positions and the color coding is tells you what the literature that particular publication claimed it to be it claimed it to be t whenever it's red and you can see most of them were red and they were finding the peak positions here and different papers reporting different places and there are a few people who were claiming t prime and three of them are actually from our group and the reason that i am saying it's t prime becomes obvious because calculated you can calculate the phonon frequencies for what the t prime phase would be and if i superimpose that the h phase gives you the signals here here and here and that accounts for the experimentally observed dots very well that you are seeing here but there are these extra features and if i now superimpose the facebook result if uh, if i uh, show you the uh, additional features that come from the t prime phase and that comes over here and you can see all the additional peaks that people have seen are accounted for the t prime phases very very well therefore the raman spectroscopy if all independent of whether it ascribed to t phase or t prime phase actually were telling us that it's the t prime phase having told you this let me now conclude this part and then move on to the next part keeping an eye on what the time is okay uh, as and i have to accelerate slightly it still leaves me with open question a whole lot of people believed it to be metallic we cannot ignore that and you have to understand why did they think it to be metallic if the t prime phase is semiconducting it's a small band gap semiconductor why did they think of it metallic there is still a puzzle remaining and this is the question that you're going to ask by asking what is the role of lithium in all this because remember chemical exfoliation i'm doing is by lithium intercalation and this is the paper that was published by yet another uh, uh, very extraordinary student there was shmita supported by other students rahul and pozrak maya and again with the same group from elektra shown over here and this was published again earlier this year in this particular journal uh, i've told you that if i look at the h phase the stable phase i see the raman spectrum these two and i say the way it is done we intercalate lithium we ultrasonicate exfoliate it and then we wash and get rid of the ill lithium what devoshmita said that let's not try to get rid of all the lithium because we want to understand what lithium is doing let us take get rid of lithium in steps so she looked at the system without washing then washing with water once twice thrice four times up to 12 times 16 times i'm going to show you the results of zero wash that will be called zero w everywhere and 12 wash because that contrast when she looked at the zero wash just chemically exfoliated sample we of course found this very intense peaks coming from the metastable state now the same sample zero wash sample when she repeatedly washed to get rid of the lithium what she found is this metastable all the metastable signatures become much weaker which tells you it is the lithium's presence that helped stabilizing the metastable state somehow which when i removed lithium it goes down drastically so lithium has a role to play in stabilizing the metastable state in some way 
which is a very exciting news, which had not been realized before. Now, having understood that, then we went on to the technique that I've already described to you, this electron microscopic work. Uh, what I'm showing you is zero wash, there's the molybdenum 3D, sulfur 2S here. You know exactly to what to expect. Stable configuration contributes here. Metastable configuration contributes here. Now it is the zero wash sample. Previously, what I showed you was the 12 wash sample. Zero wash, I have more metastable state. I can map the entire molybdenum signal, see where the flake is, beautiful molybdenum disulfide flake. I can also take the two regions that I had marked before take the ratio and you can see the ratio shows extensive amount of this metastable state everywhere the flake remains almost visible everywhere with equal intensity this turns out to be the best point and i'm going to look at that point when i look at that point i can separate out in two parts the t prime and the h phase and i find 80 percent of the metastable state and 20 percent the stable phase at that particular spot here Having understood that, now what I'm going to look at, draw your attention to, that there's a little bump here, which I had not shown you before in the previous study. And that was a 12 wash, and there we didn't see this bump very much. In this particular case, this bump that shows up, we interpreted it as plasmon satellites. Subsequently, there's another publication from Germany in FISREF B that have done yield study and indeed specified they find as plasmon satellite exactly at this separation array, therefore confirming our interpretation of this as the plasmon satellite. Uh, the presence of plasmon satellite in this particular case and not in the other shows that in this case, zero wash case, we have nearly free electron density present in the system. And having said that, uh, that I want to show you what happens with the 12 wash sample. The 12 wash sample is shown over here, and I can go through very quickly. Again, there's the molybdenum flake that I'm talking about. I can look at the ratio, I can pick the point, and I can separate out in the 12 wash. I find now you see that the bump is not there. The plasma satellite is weakened, and also now the T prime phase is only 70%, H phase is 30%, whereas in the zero case, I had 80%, 20%. And this 70, 30 percent is only at this point where it is maximum. If on this flake I go and look at other points, the metastable state is much weaker because lithium has been washed out and therefore some amount of the metastable state got converted back into the stable phase because the presence of lithium stabilized the metastable state for the zero wash phase. Now, there's some more that you can extract from here by comparing the zero wash and 12 wash. And that is what I'm going to do now. Zero wash and 12 wash, let us go. I'm pulling out the data, only the fitted result, this one, and normalized. So what I'm showing you, let me tell you that you can see this is the zero wash, the T prime signal, and this is the zero wash H signal. And this, and this is the, that has the plasmon satellite, zero wash. If I now show you the 12 wash, the dashed line blue is the T prime 12 wash, and this is the red 12 wash H signal that doesn't have the plasma signal. Besides that, you can see a systematic shift between the two. The 12 wash T prime and the zero wash T prime, they're shifted. 12 wash H and zero wash H are shifted. And that shift is about 0.3 electron volt for every peak not only for molybdenum, because this shift can come from many things. So we looked at the sulfur also. It turns out, and I'll jump forward, and sulfur also shows the 0.3 electron volt shift. So both molybdenum and sulfur shifting in the same direction. So it cannot be a charge transfer from molybdenum to sulfur that is making this shift because then the shift will be in the opposite direction. Not only the core levels, if I look at the valence band, the valence band is the H phase, this near the valence band, uh, Fermi energy is zero. And between the leading edge of the Fermi edge, you can see a 0.2 if we shift between the two, again, exactly in the same way. What is going on here? Let me tell you schematically, and that would be quite easy for you to understand. What do we have? In an electronic structure, we have some core levels that I see in my electron spectroscopy of the valence band and the conduction band. If I have a semiconductor, my Fermi energy is pinned somewhere in between this gap. I don't see this part. I see this part and this part, my electron spectroscopy. If lithium is present, zero wash, 
what does lithium do? It contributes electrons into the system. So when electron goes into the system, my electron will go and populate this part and the form energy will move up here. So what I'll see, I'll still not see this part in electron spectroscopy because there's no electron here. But my form energy will be here. If there's some intensity, large intensity, I'll see it. But if it is very small amount, I won't see it, but I'll see this part and that part. So if I separate out, I should see like this, which should be identical if this intensity I cannot see because it's very small. It should be identical to what I've seen in the undoped case and doped case. But there is a trick. The trick is that electron spectroscopy doesn't look at it this way. Electron spectroscopy aligns the Fermi energy. So that this Fermi energy and that Fermi energy will get aligned. When I look at the spectrum, so that gets shifted. When they get shifted, this shift now actually shows up as a shift in the core level as well as in the valence band by the same amount. So that 0 0.2, 0 0.3 electron volt shift that I'm seeing in the core level and in the valence band arises from this doping by lithium of the states at the low intensity states that I don't see clearly, but from the shift, I understand that lithium is doping. And when lithium dopes, or because of temperature or because of any other defect like sulfur vacancies, will always dope the system and the Fermi energy will move up. It will make the system more conducting. And therefore, you'll think that it's metallic. At room temperature, even the biggest insulator is a metal because there's finite number of electrons that are free to move around. So at finite temperature in presence of doping, you can see it as metallic because of doping and lithium is small presence of lithium tends to make it uh, metallic as well as tries to stabilize the T' prime structure. So this is the story that we have said about the T' prime structure and uh, I don't, uh, let me conclude because I think we'd lost some time in the beginning, but let me try to get back the conference into uh, its time schedule by summarizing here, uh, the chemical exfoliation uh, leads to the T prime phase that you have seen, it's not the T phase. And the T prime phase is a small gap semiconductor, but lithium ions are present in various concentrations, depending on how well you're washing it. The lithium, presence of lithium, actually stabilizes, not stabilizes, it helps in tilting the balance in favor of T prime to some extent. So you get more T prime when you have more lithium and it also dopes the system. And in fact, we believe it is this doping that sort of stabilizes the T prime state favorably. <clears throat> and that's what tends to make it more conducting. I'll not call it metallic, it's not a true metal, it's a doped semiconductor, depending on where the Fermi energy is, how much you're doping, its transport property will depend. Um, this is a part that I'll not talk about uh, because uh, as I said that I'll try to get back the conference on time. It is a different story that I'll talk about another day, but just to give you a glimpse of the kind of power we have with the technique that I have talked about. This is again, a collaboration driven by Debosh Mita and the samples uh, come from Arindam Ghosh and it's a collaboration with Arindam Manish and his student Myth. And of course, our constant uh, companion, Luca and his, and uh, Matthew and Hikmet uh, that we're doing. Now we are looking at a heterostructure where you can take a substrate, silicon, silicon dioxide substrate. On top of that, you can put a HBN boron nitride. On top of that, you put a molybdenum salt disulfide and cover it with graphene. Because what it does is to exert a strain on MOTS2. And by looking at different parts, I can put the sample here, photon here, or here, or here, or here. I can pick out what happens to molybdenum disulfide on the strain because of the structs putting it on the HBN. And you have looked at that, this strain effect, there's a lot of discussion in the literature and you have understood uh, in great detail what happens, but let me not go through that and uh, come to the final slide, thanking you for your patience and thank you very much. So I am ready to take uh, now the... Yeah. Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Shamba, for uh, the nice and uh, very clear uh, presentation. It was really interesting. So there are a lot of questions, but for want of time, let me pick some uh, questions and I'll post it to you. So the first question is uh, from Dr. Gargirena. 
uh, considering the presence of uh, both H and T phases, how does one perform phase dependent application study? Well, I mean, uh, either, there are uh, now some reports where a uh, single phase has been stabilized and uh, you can try to make larger ones. So basically it will have to be driven by uh, synthetic techniques being explored. That is one aspect. The other aspect is that there are many applications where you actually don't care about having a single phase. I showed many the supercapacitor hydrogen evolution reaction, where the presence of large presence of the metastable state you're making use of and getting these extraordinary properties. Maybe if you have chemical synthetic technique that increases the proportion of these metastable state, you'll get even better optimization. And finally, do not forget that the mixed phase is an integral sample in fact, this is something that you are addressing and we should be submitting the paper very, very soon. The fact is that the, there's a lot more twist. It is not a T prime phase that is inside an H phase, but not connected to the H phase. The fact that this metastable state grows inside the H phase exerts a lot of strain on the both the phases because there has to be a matching stitching of the atoms on the periphery, which means that Though I have idealized the description in terms of T prime phase, it is not a pure T prime phase also. It's a distorted T prime phase and a very complex distortion is taking place and it, that alters its chemical property, which means that sometimes you might be interested in this mixed phase because it has a unique property which a pure T prime phase will not have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. The other question is, even in hydrothermally synthesized MOS2, one notices this discrepancy of whether a particular condition gives rise to T or H phase. So what can it be attributed to? Again, as I say, that because you go through, the process is that you're providing a lot of energy. In the hydrothermal case, what you do is to, instead of the lithiums, you put in hydrogen, uh, the water in between, and then exfoliate the thing. So it's basically, again, through certain kind of intercalation. And then you actually, this high energy process distorts the lattice structure and you bring in sulfur vacancies we suspect i have not done experiments but our personal suspicion is that a lot of sulfur vacancies form they donate electrons just like lithium does and that is the one mechanism by which it tends to tilt again the balance towards the metastable state remember it still remains metastable you can anneal it out and get back almost pure h phase in all these cases. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Ramesh. MOS2 is known to have sulfur vacancies. What is the contribution from these vacancies uh, uh, in all these results? Uh, as I just now said, we are yeah. exactly that very question. And uh, the basically what happens is that sulfur vacancy donates electrons in the system. And therefore, it tries to bring in distortion, and there's a very good reason for that. And this is exactly what we are addressing in the paper that, as I said, we'll be submitting very soon uh, in, in, a, in a couple of days' time. So maybe uh, it's yeah. you wait okay, for the yeah. next story. Yes, yes, thank you. So the last question, can uh, any XAFS also used to determine the T phase of MOS2? And what is the role of sulfur satellite peak in terms of charge transfer? Sulfur satellites? Peak in charge transfer. Okay, yeah, charge uh, transfer. Uh, there are two questions. Uh, the question, first question is whether I can do XAFs. <clears throat> uh, you have to understand that XAFs, what it does and what it doesn't, what it is good for and what it is not good for. It is not good for determining the bond distances with great accuracy. It's accuracy. I mean, I may offend some XFs practitioners, but I also use XFs extensively. It's difficult to pin down bond distance separate difference for more than 0 0.05 angstrom, particularly in a mixed state, which means that the subtle dimerization, etc., it will be very difficult to see in XFs. Okay? So it will depend on a lot of data massaging trying to get answers out. On the other hand, it's a local probe. So uh, 
also again it doesn't again excess doesn't will not depend whether it's anti eclipse or eclipsed as i talked about the sulfurs remember because it doesn't really depend on the symmetry of the coordination it basically depends on the coordination number and the bond distances so it will not distinguish except for in subtle ways the gross effect of excess will not distinguish between the prismatic structure and the octahedral structure because it leaves exactly the same number of sulfur atoms at same distance away and the small changes in the bond distances uh, in the mixed state my suspicion is that it's not going to be very easy but you know if we can can anticipate all experimental results we don't have to do experiments anymore which me, uh, with that i imply that do the experiments see what you can but these are the limitations that you may come across the other question is not a very well formed question about in charge transfer the charge transfer is determined by the sulfur level at sulfur 3p level and molybdenum 4d level and the sulfur and the molybdenum states i was look, showing you was at the core level and i showed a plasmon satellite so it's uh, i would suggest the person can send me an email with a well formed question rather than taking the time away from the next speaker and i'll reply in greater detail yeah so thank you professor uh, sharma again it was indeed a nice and a clear presentation and uh, the Thank participants you. were really enjoying your presentation Thank so you very on behalf of the center for nanotechnology once again uh, thank you dr sharma for accepting our invitation and giving a wonderful talk thank you very thank much you. i'll thank leave you. now i'll yeah. be keep staying joined but Perfect. we'll be logging out and logging back in i think I, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, fine i'll uh, come back as a participant so that i don't interfere in the okay in the... yeah sure 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 have a good thank day. you very yeah. much good thank you good bye bye andrew bye